Testing, testing. Check, check. One, two, yeah. three, one, two, three. I think we are yeah. good. We're good. Uh, so you were just saying that a lot of the studios you you do are at the urban scale? Yeah, we have a sequence called the Research Studio, which is two seminars during the fall and the winter quarters that lead into um, Design Studio in the, in the third quarter. So it's a chance to essentially make a... Um, a version of something more like a, a AA unit where, you know, you teach somebody all year long. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we introduce concepts and design techniques and um, the problems and scenarios during the first couple quarters of work on things. So, but generally, um, I would say for the last 10 years, for the most part, these studios, um, I'm, I'm working on on super big uh, projects, um, and I think I've just always had a, a strong connection to, you know, experimental work from the '60s quite a bit, both at the level of a autonomous objects and buildings and the way in which technology can scale up and down, mm -hmm. um, both in abstract terms and in practical terms. So, archigram and and metabolism. Um, <clears throat> French uh, work <laughs> from the 50s and 60s. Um, the French ex expert we have. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Marina, I'm sure you, you know all of that work. Um, because urban speculation is uh, not very empirical and hard to quantify, and bits and pieces of um, evidence, you know, fall out of it, but a lot of it is is uh, goes onto the stockpile of, you know, pure speculation. Right. And um, so it's a way to attack uh, urban problems, which are very conventional, say in the case of L.A., lack of density, mm -hmm. problems with housing, um, traffic problems, all of which don't have automatic solutions to them, especially because of political resistance and political turmoil, nimbyism, um, the flow of capital in certain directions, but not in all directions and so forth. So I enjoy talking about those um, things as layers to my studio's relationship between the social and capital, between uh, what we understand as first world problems and things like that. I, I believe in that kind of discourse. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I'm an architect and I want to give students, you know, skill sets. So instead of just doing diagrams and and basic massing, I take it all the way through where these co uh, concepts from even politics can track their way finally through a project, which in many cases are very highly designed, have aesthetics attached to them and make claims about that. So you can only do that if you're talking to 10 students for a year and they can hear your voice. Um, they can work off of method that I give them and then also understand when I go into what I call free fall mode, which <laughs> is, I don't know what's going to happen. They're better equipped to, let's say, parachute through that kind of free fall world. So the free fall mode happens in a particular time of the semester. Like once the project moves along far enough, then they, they have to figure it out. Is that weird? Um, not always, but, uh, this year in particular, um, I gave them the the concept of doing these, you know, one kilometer round ground up cities to, you know, densify the project. And our biggest challenge is to single family level density. Uh, of course, it's also something that's been put out there and rejected in the past about densifying not just uh, accessory dwelling units, but mm -hmm let's say accumulating single family houses along um, or near transit oriented districts that may transform into four or five, six story, you know, multi-unit buildings. That's a, that's a, a an almost unthinkable concept hmm. in the realm of zoning, you know, in Los Angeles, which is based, was based on autonomy, the garden and Arcadia. And so Arcadia is gone, um, especially at the sustainable level. So we have those things, but after that, they have to write scenarios about how the zoning would work and why or how you would deploy 40 story towers over here versus low rise world over here or various kinds of typologies. I work with them and introduce things, but 
in this particular year right now, it's in it's in a kind of exciting free fall mode where um, each team starts to, in a way, kind of compete with one another because we're beyond the the initial trajectory of the mission of the studio. Mm -hmm. Some studios are more scripted mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the outcomes are more protected and there's a little bit of, of advancement right? Um, where I might say I want to bias it toward honing certain kinds of, of techniques. This year is much more um, working with unknowns and it's kind of exciting in that sense. It's interesting because the, the studio I'm teaching right now is the uh, fourth year, second semester, uh, they call it the urban studio. It's still supposed to be an architecture class. Um, although because the word urban is so broadly defined, it's kind of up to the teacher to figure out what that means. But anyway, so the students are having to design a pretty large area. I don't know if you're familiar with Lafayette Park, which is, so, yes. yeah, Wilshire Kings mm -hmm. and there's the park. So they have kind of full control over the entire Lafayette Park to do whatever they want, which is mm -hmm. a decent chunk of land. Mm -hmm. um, and I decided to not give them any program. So they would have to do research of that area and figure out what should happen there to improve better, whatever, et cetera, the place. Mm -hmm. And the unknown factor of that kind of process is 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 daunting, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Um, and and you know, not giving any program might sound kind of extreme, but it's. I've often found that when you tell a student that you're going to design X program, they automatically jump to their preconceptions about it. And they get really stuck within it. And like 90% of the effort of the teacher just goes to trying to get them to think outside of that framework. And it's been very interesting so far to see uh, the students wrestle with this idea of like, no one's telling me it should be one thing or the other. I have to try and figure it out. Of course, I try and help them along the way, but it's that kind of unknownness that that is quite scary, it seems like. <laughs> well, students are, are we, we were all in that position uh, as well, but as students, we imagine because we're naive and we don't have a, a grasp of, um, you know, 20 years in, in terms of design thinking, that architecture too is not empirical even in the face of the metrics of programs, right? So mm -hmm. programs are the axiomatic uh, device or site perhaps, so those are the main things that essentially allow a student to to move forward because they aren't yet trained as you're trying to do to give them the tools to be able to conduct research uh, in a forensic way to uncover what's not there because in a way uh, whatever they do uncover may still be an interpretation of a certain fuzzy set of numbers or facts. Yep. So I talk to my students about um, uh, the idea that everything is arbitrary until you decide that it is not. And that, in fact, is the case. Everything I do is arbitrary, not everything, because we have constraints and, you know, limits and metrics and, you know, numbers. But once you get into what might be meaningful, then I'm writing a text, whether I'm engineering it or reverse engineering it, that could move in one direction or another. But I, I decide or we decide as a team how to get past uh, guesswork and hunches mm -hmm. and uh, essentially leverage a, an argument that is uh, debatable. And then it's a question of how much with how much force you you can argue for that work. A student is not equipped with that kind of nerve. Um, they're not, the, regardless of one's personality. Mm -hmm. And so I think your idea is not just simply laissez-faire teaching, because I don't believe in laissez-faire <laughs> teaching, because you're going to... AKA lazy teaching. <laughs> AKA, yeah, I skipped studio and didn't, <laughs> didn't come. Um, so your idea of give, not giving them a program is essentially... Um, put them on a different kind of ground, perhaps a shakier ground for them that will will force them to do um, the kind of research that you you presumably would help them research right. how to understand and structure research, where to where to where and how to be a detective and see what you're going to uncover and interpret the fingerprints and footprints, so to speak, to drive that kind of metaphor. Because at that point, you also know that the research isn't going to give a, a deterministic 
tab A fits into slot B, I've discovered it. It's still going to be um, uh, a, 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 a highly unscientific, you know, approach. Yeah. 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 And uh, the thing I found is that even if they are feeling like they don't know where to start, there's always something latent within them, especially right. because a lot of students I have have lived in Los Angeles for a very long time or are from Los Angeles. Yes. So, you know, even though staring at the blank page might feel, uh, like I said, daunting, it's like, well, you have stuff inside of you. You've been in the city. You know it probably better than I do. What are your thoughts about it? Mm -hmm. And it starts off as intuition, as, a, as anecdotes, as, as really unquantifiable things. But the fun part of it is trying to kind of look backwards and figure out how these things, why they are justifiable and why they end up being, you know, uh, within, uh, for good reason, right? Um, but yeah. we'll see how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see, we'll yeah. see how the end of the semester goes. Good luck. <laughs> so does the studio you teach right now, um, is it like a fifth year studio, an undergrad graduate studio? It's the final year of the graduate three-year okay. Master of Architecture okay. program. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we don't have thesis at UCLA. That okay. was terminated in 2006 um, because we, dis we as a faculty decided that... Um, we saw students struggling with the idea of self-expression and mm. and the proprietary nature of design and we just said that they would benefit from a bit of a hybrid uh last year which is still driven by the agenda of a faculty member but trying to uncover it and um i i think make a make a different kind of trajectory than what you would get in a 10-week because uh, our we are our quarters are super fast. And, quarters are really yeah. fast, and and um, you can only set the bar so high and accomplish so much in that time. So, um, it's an erstwhile thesis at some particular level, but it's also very far removed because um, I supply the the motivating agenda, and they're not plagued by that. And uh, we didn't see it as a as some sort of we saw it partly as a fix to a problem, but we also just made a decision about American education, hmm. which was um, that it needed to continue in the realm of, of um, not so much expert learner, um, because in thesis, it's still expert learner, but if it's your project, then the student becomes unconsciously, theoretically, the expert, the one who's supposed to um, uh, accumulate knowledge and ideas and the critic is a is a bit of a follower to that um, it's something that we just decided we wouldn't we wouldn't do um, for for, um, for those reasons and it's it's worked out well how long have you been teaching at UCLA since 2002 um, oh, wow. I went over uh, about a half a year uh, after I stepped down from being director at SciArc. I taught at SciArc from mm -hmm. the time I got to Los Angeles, which was 1988, and uh, I started UCLA. So I was at SciArc for 14 years, and now I've wow. been at, at um, UCLA for 17 years. Wow. Uh, <laughs> and Columbia before that, so. Wow. And yeah. you've been practicing and teaching pretty much the yes. whole time? Yes, That's the so whole very time. impressive. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have you seen a change in the students over the course of the 30 some odd years that you've been involved in academia? Uh, I think that the students have changed uh, just in relation to uh, technology and, and media. Um, we're all still human beings and everybody's still earnest and uh, students still show up and want to study architecture, even in the age of um, even in the age of the digital and even in the age in which you could make a living not pouring concrete or stacking bricks, you could make a living doing design, you know, in the, in the immaterial world, um, uh, or differently than, than architecture. Architecture is, um, still the same medium it always was, but it, it seems because of digital media, the web, uh, the flow of information, um, accessibility, uh, the appetite for nowness, and so forth. Mm -hmm. We all, we all, we all see architecture as an even more special medium because while we work on it through digital tools, 
um, they're still relatively slow plotting handmade, um, you know, buildings as an outcome. But I'm speaking from a conventional practitioner's mm. uh, point of view. Sure. Um, but of course, students have changed, um, as we all have, um, in terms of being global citizens and how we communicate, um, where we uh, where we treat the idea of research versus inspiration, for instance, is a is a fault line that I would say is is new now. Where mm. with so much access, uh, students are looking for inspiration. Where before, with less access one treated it more like research. So there was a bit more of a deep sea diving right. with analog uh, worlds and analog <laughs> tools. So access and speed produce an idea that the cursory uh, search is limited to inspiration, which is a term that's too overused in my book um, <laughs> as opposed to research. But that's and I don't even say that like I'm 60 years old and everybody else is, uh, you know, too young to understand that. I think about it across everything just because I'm a rigorous person and I want to, you know, think about work in a very organized way. Oh, that makes total sense to me. And I think yeah. inspiration kind of when you hear a person present something and they say, I was inspired by this or this is inspired by that, it's almost like automatically as a critic, you're not allowed to ask a question. With, like, you know what I mean? It's like yeah. it's, it came to me. And yeah. And uh, I think it, that's it's it's problematic as a professional, but then as a, from an education standpoint, it, it kind of gives the student a pass, you know, and it, they, you don't get to kind of question them further. <laughs> I, I think that inspiration, you know, has its place, fleeting things. But of course, it would be if if I, you know, if I back in the day was in you know the Fog Library looking at some Austrian action artists from the 60s that I didn't know, I'd be super inspired, but I'd also get 10 other books on 10 other action artists, and then I'd study it as a movement, mm -hmm. right? So it's a question of the follow-up. And when there's the next thing that's presented to you, you don't need to um, move in a way. Uh, so that's a that's not particular to any group or, or anything. I think everybody in every um, culture, uh, in every field, in every discipline is um, susceptible, you know, to the ease of access so that curating, you might curate, but you might curate um, in, a, in a more unconsciously uh, controlled way as opposed to really thinking about mm. how to go in certain you know sorts of directions. So, if students, for instance, are autodidacts because they spend most of their time not in studio, they spend most of their time not sitting at the desk with the critic. There are charges and agendas, of course, that you give them, and they work on them. But you don't want a student to um, strictly say, "I got this crit. I'm just going to resolve that." Sure. And that's my mission. Right. There, there are those students, yeah. <laughs> and you can always tell that they're, everything they ask and say is, is in search of like the answer. And you can say all the conceptual and, and, and analogies you want, but at the end of it, 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 they always ask another question, which is like, so, but what do I do? <laughs> right. I, I, I think let's, uh, let's also make sure that all the students out there listening, uh, <laughs> we, are, we are simply talking about <clears throat> the contemporary conditions you know, under which we teach and, you know, learn about architecture. And I would say that um, my particular goal is to understand um, the, what we might call the natural condition, you know, vis-a-vis -vis media, and mm. to find ways to work with it and co-opt it rather than, you know, quarantine somebody and say, never use these kinds of tools. All I'll say is something like, if you go on Arc Daily every day and you download pictures, what you should do is have a mission that day to say, I'll look at houses, I'll look at wood houses, I'll look at houses in Portugal, something really nerdy, you know, and specific, especially even if it doesn't apply to what you're doing. Mm. In other words, you, you are forcing yourself not to just uh, frantically go, where can I get an idea for my project? And actually understanding how to look and think and be organized will give you more capacity 
to learn and grow uh, as a student, as opposed to trying to find what one might imagine is a is a blueprint, you know, floating around out there for you. So it's it's just another way of looking at what does it mean to look at the world, have uh, uh, a control over the access, and how you apply things. Um, so that's my, that's what I do. I, I tell them I do the same thing that they do, um, and I look and I study architects' work quite a lot. I love studying the work of architects, architects that I might not, not even naturally say I'm in love with, but I want to see what certain things are going on with the work. Mm. That's always very surprising for, for, for students just in terms of telling them that, you know, there's a, there's a pretty global perspective going on, you know, with the work and learning never stops. And, and they're surprised to hear it from you because you're Neil Dinar. I, I, I think so. I, I, I think so. I think they're, they might be thinking, well, why do you need to do that? Right. Um, you, you're, you're the source of material that everybody else looks at. So, and this you know, kind of talk about the the world as a global production um, mm -hmm. and thinking that we stand in relation to, you know, work that's gone before us, no matter how new we think we are, no matter how original we think we are. And, you know, it's one thing to appropriate history, and some people do that. I don't particularly do that. I synthesize uh, <laughs> historical models and work toward my own you know, project, but it, but it all comes from, um, studying, not just simply looking. So let's say it's a kind of ethic mm. that I speak to my students about and they respond to it because I don't berate them. I don't say that, you know, uh, the old days were better than the new days. I prefer living in 2019, <laughs> trust me, <laughs> than, than 30 years ago. I prefer now. The iPhone makes it pretty convenient. I prefer now. <laughs> I, I told my students yesterday, no, yeah, yesterday I, I popped into my head. I said, I'm not even sure you need a teacher. What you need is curiosity and Google and an organized mind. An organized and mind, I'm right. serious about that because once you get out of school, those are your tools. It's completely amazing. Uh, it's very lethal at mm -hmm. the same time. So you could you could go a long way with that. It is funny because when you do graduate, it's like, wait, I don't have a teacher to tell me, give me answers anymore. How do I figure this out? <laughs> right. Network and ask people. Right. Um, so yeah, it seems like being very organized in your in the in the approach to studying or maybe just the designing itself even is pretty important to your process. Yeah, I think it's it it is, and I would have to say that um, going back to the time and when I was a student, and oddly enough, um, I didn't have. I didn't. I didn't end up having teachers who were as as uh, self aware and insightful as I am. <laughs> I say that with all humility. I wish that was the case. But I think if you're a teacher and you don't feel that way, then you should maybe think about why. You're right. Teaching. Right. Uh, but I wanted to say that um, while I had, you know, all the energy in the world and and a certain, um, in a way, a certain. I wouldn't even say anarchist spirit because I was always connected to precision and and um, especially things that um, I, I think in terms of technological ambition in architecture is not about anything other than uh, dealing with um, form in relation to performance and craft and so forth. So that formed the the early basis. But I worked intuitively you know, quite a lot. And then my education really began after school. And um, I just, you know, I got an apartment in New York and I sat down at my drawing board and I drew very simple things to try to start from scratch. And, you know, um, I read philosophy of science and I tried to understand what did it mean to, to um, you know, contend with um, the idea of uncertainty or, you know, the world of the quantum and what would that mean in terms of architecture. So sort of heady, quasi pretentious ideas, but it was helping me think about um, how could I apply thinking to, you know, concepts and then turn it into to form. And then ultimately it just led all these years to being um, uh, 
obviously I've got more skills, you know, uh, than now for, um, handling all that stuff, but it's really led me not to, I think complete, I, I, I still work quite intuitively, but I find ways to discipline the intuition much, much earlier in the process. Mm. So there's a huge amount of guesswork. There's a huge amount of, of, um, uh, let's say I'm trying to reify a concept, which is not really strictly with a blueprint, you know, in the field yet, you're trying to move something forward. So I'm guessing, but I'm going to find disciplined ways, whether, whether it's about organizational principles or geometric principles or, or, or even material to work through those concepts. And, it, and, um, I still think it's arbitrary until I decide that it's not arbitrary, but it becomes not arbitrary through, I think, a persuasiveness of 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 um, kind of rigor and and precision. That's right. a hallmark of of what I do, what we do as an office, and and kind of how I think. Even though somebody could dismiss it at the same time, I'm my ambition is to be hardcore, <laughs> <laughs> uh, hardcore and very persuasive. Right. Right. Um, in an in an unempirical discipline right do you think that that kind of discipline to operate in it and without it is somehow irresponsible no uh i think that uh that's too moralizing and and that's uh, a good question um and what i don't like in architecture is moralizing and so <clears throat> platitudes or, you know, you talking about your process and what you believe in and so forth is, um, let's say it depends on how you deploy it and how you kind of treat your audience. So Patrick Schumacher is, and he wouldn't dispute this. It's almost, he's a moralist, you know, relative to his project, mm -hmm. which is to say he believes his way is the only way for instance right the world of the parametric is the is the only style and discipline and process and he's stated that so it's a it's um it's political it's it's you know that invokes the political the moral invokes uh you know human uh, behavior and and belief mm -hmm. slash religion and I, I don't think or I, I, I hate architecture when it gets, you know, to that point, although I do believe in manifestos, I believe in paradigms, but I believe that they're um, minor and provisional and should never be seen as if you're not working one way or the other, then you're, you're, you're not working in the right way. Isn't, but it, it, don't some of those issues come in to play directly when you're dealing with urban design as opposed to architecture? And the question of morals and social ethics and polit politics and things like that. If you do something at an urban scale, which again, what if what's the, the line between urban design and architecture is? You can debate about that. But an urban design uh, project, aren't you forced to answer those things in a way? Whereas with an architecture, you 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 don't have to. Do you, do you know what I mean? Yes, yeah, I okay. do. Yes, okay. I do. <laughs> yes, I do. I think that. Um, I, I think the idea of the the moralization of that is let's put that aside for the for the moment but the social and political dimension obviously of urban design where you're dealing with um aspects of projecting control over uh territory mm -hmm. and people and control again being a, a term which is you know lack of control you have uh you know chaos too much control, you've got authoritarianism, <clears throat> both of which, you know, when you think about space in relation to politics and ownership and free space, all of those things are, you know, completely bound up, you know, together. And I agree, um, you, you tend toward those kinds of um, dimensions in, in political philosophy and urban culture than just talking about the autonomous you know, the autonomous object. So one might be about just craft and working method. The other one in terms of scale is about how you intervene in, in various, uh, turbulent forces. Mm. And you do have to have, um, 
a stance and you do have to have ideas. And um, I think we can see that quite a lot in terms of, let's say, how we understand cities now relative to um, uh, class systems, accessibility, um, economies, and so forth, for which some people would say architects should just stay out of that. Mm -hmm. I generally... I generally agree, but if you can ever hope to have a voice, you do what you can, even outside of your own design, to try to affect what you might believe is, you know, positive, um, you know, positive change. Um, I'll give you one example that um, I was talking to my students about, but I live on the west side, and there's this development down there, relatively near the airport, called Playa Vista. And uh, it was a wetlands and an open site. It was one of the largest open sites in any uh, city in North America. I don't know exactly how many hectares, but huge. And um, this was about 98, 1998. And a neighbor who was an architect came to me and he said, Neil, we've got to band together and have this development stamped out because it's going to kill our neighborhood and all the traffic and so forth. And first thing I, 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 I said was, what if it was your project? What would you be saying? You probably going, Neil, would you help me p get this project passed? Mm. And I said, no, I won't help you stamp it out. He said, I can't believe that you don't want to preserve, you know, the sanctity of your neighborhood. And I said, I believe in building cities. Of course, it doesn't mean that whatever happens is okay. Yeah. 25 years later, yes, there's way, way more traffic in my neighborhood. My street is a cut through. Um, and I wouldn't say that I drive away with a smile on my face, but I'm also sitting there saying, um, good, there's 5,000 people who live down there. A lot of them work in Silicon Beach. Uh, uh, which is, you know, a huge transforming, you know, economy. Um, par parenthetically, of course, as you saw, sorry to get off the topic, but Amazon leaves New York, half the people are mad, yeah. half the people are, are happy. Yeah. So going back to the idea of scale and, and the urban, it becomes tantamount to politics in terms of how you see your own um, civic life being played out. And those are those are more complex discussions than simply me talking about how I work with my office sure. to, you know, get a building done or how I think about it or something. So it's a good question, a, a, a good idea about scale and dimension and sphere. Right, right. Ooh, we got heavy, heavy on a Friday morning. <laughs> but so, it's, it's interesting that when you think about it, people are most likely always rejecting a bigger building taking over a smaller one in cities or mm -hmm. small yes. towns, right? Yes. But why is that? Is that because the, 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 the cute picture of the house with the garden is being taken away for a multi-story apartment building that could have multiple family living in a smaller footprint? Like, do people judge it in a way that is purely from the outside without thinking further than what it actually tries to do? Well, I think... Um if if you the, I think on a human on a human level, you know, one's comfort, you know, our our each person's sense of comfort, you know, either comes with some idea of uh, I earned this, mm -hmm. I don't want it taken away from mm -hmm. me. I I I I made this for myself. I was able to do this financially. Um, it it becomes a lifestyle. And why would I want that, you know, taken away? The only way in which that person could say something differently is to have a perspective about sharing, right? Uh, about sharing space, uh, about sharing um, resources. And that's, of course, that comes from either a morality or an ethic that's different than um, privatization, you know, and ownership. And so the where cities are basically working off of, you know, private, especially when you own land, you know, the sovereignty of land in America is a big, yeah. mm -hmm. is a big thing. Yeah. And I, I get that. I understand that. I, I, I'm, 
privileged to have a small house on the west side and and uh i i enjoy it and i have a view and a and a garden and 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 so forth but um my personal politics is i don't say uh, keep everything away i earn this and and i want to live in perpetuity with the you know the benefits of this i'm an architect and i've got a different idea so if if somebody said what if two houses down you know five story building i would say that's totally fine with me and then we'll all find a, a civic uh, agreement um yeah if you if you are going to be in a certain residential neighborhood then living in a an apartment building might not mean that you could play your music as loud as you wanted <laughs> all night cuz that's a that's a different type of environmental sharing let's say which wouldn't make me um a bad person i think i you know i play loud music in my garage and record but no one can hear it so <laughs> I'm 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 taking care of what I think is as far as you know. Is, maybe the neighbors are well, just no. complaining. <laughs> my next door neighbor's he's he's older, so maybe his <laughs> is, is 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 shot. Uh, but um, and you know it's very important that we that 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 as architects we aren't projecting a tone deaf, you know, uh, like we think we know what's going on, but but we don't. I think that. It's really about how to understand uh, what does it mean to to exist and coexist in a city and and share and economize uh, resources. In the in in the in the case of L.A., the single family house footprint dominates, and zoning uh, will only allow a certain height <clears throat> in certain uh, areas. And my argument is that there will have to be some incremental change. And not only my argument, but say of my colleague Dana Cuff and and other politicians that she's engaged with about this, but it scares people. Right. I will just say one, one more thing. I think this is true. If it's not, then I propagating some story that's useful, but proposition um, S a couple of years ago, which got uh, you weren't here yet that got voted down it was for high high density uh uh, uh, uh not allowing high density development around transit districts and, and it got voted down the it got voted down so that meaning development can still happen right mm -hmm. so it was a it was a it was a rebuke to let's say the nimby project yeah. but we heard that one of the people who actually wrote this, his office is in a high rise in Hollywood and his view was going to be cut off by another high rise mm -hmm. to the north. My view means everything to me. I own it. I earned it. And now it's going to be taken away from me. That was the biggest irony I could. I could. I just thought it was a perfect irony for what did it mean to. Yeah. Um, not want to have the city grow yeah. because the privatization and the, of the view was was the driver, you know, of everything. And um, all I say is, I think everybody in Hong Kong's fine with looking at other <laughs> looking at other you towers. You just get used to it. It's just yeah. what what life is, right? You know, I mean, at some point, it maybe there's not enough sunlight in general, and everyone's too pale. But no, this it's not the end of the world, right? <laughs> Although I also understand, like, having the view of the mountains or whatever that view was, I can see where you'd want to keep it. <laughs> yeah, but you have to accept change, too, right, if you want things to evolve. No. You can't just stay attached to that cute picture for life because then you just, I don't, I don't know, you, you're not living in the present. You are not moving forward. Right. Well, it's coming from people who just left New York City <laughs> to Southern California. Yeah, I should ask better. you, how are, how, are you uh, how are you coping with... Uh... How are you enjoying or coping? <laughs> enjoying is more like it. It's uh -huh. such an it's an easy move to come back, and also because mm -hmm. I'm from Southern California, so mm -hmm. it, it, I'm familiar with it. Um, it and it's, it's it's just easy. Like when we moved to New York City, well, it was also we had no jobs. We just packed up and moved, uh, which was I don't know if we would do that now. It's quite quite ris risky looking back, yeah. um, but. You know, you have a car down here, you get in your car, drive to Costco, buy giant cases of whatever food and drive back home, walk 20 feet, put it inside the fridge. 
you know, as opposed to the New York narrative for us, at least was get a giant uh, hiking backpack, get on the subway 40 minutes to the, the to the supermarket, stand in line for half an hour, 45 minutes subway back, you know, mm-hmm. for two weeks of food. So it's that kind of stuff that makes it a lot easier. And that's mm-hmm. the kind of that's the stuff that sounds out the most, I think, when we first got here was how quickly we could do groceries. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, we haven't and we haven't really been in L.A. proper that much to really get a good sense of, you know, the urban mm-hmm. experience mm-hmm. there. But the only few times we went, having the car, it makes it very, very different. Mm-hmm. You Because you really just go from A to B, mm-hmm. get out of your car, walk a block or two, and go back in and go somewhere else. Mm-hmm. The continuity of the urban experience is, yeah. is not as the one in New York. Mm-hmm. It's really fragmented. It's really... I don't know. It's maybe that's why it's hard to understand um, the city here. It's because it's just little glimpse, you know, yeah. without having the continuous experience. Yeah, that's actually the thing. When you know people we meet say LA is the best city in the world. I love it. And granted, we're fairly new here, but as Marina said, it, we're kind of left wondering. Yeah, but what does that mean? Because you're basically going from one destination to inside of a car to another destination. So I don't really know. That and the streets are so wide, you know, like in in New York, as you know, you you could be on one (laughs) side of the street, you still have a sense of what's going on on the other side, you still, you know, you can interact with the other side here when the roads are, I don't know, four, six lanes, it's it's, it's gigantic, you don't, I don't know, I feel like it's a canyon between me (laughs) and the other side of the street, Mm -hmm. Yeah. there is no, there is, I don't know, the street experience is very different. Well, it's, it's it's the reason why people don't like coming to Los Angeles or would say it's a, it's not a city, um, (laughs) because it's not pedestrian oriented. Right. Right. Um, and the convenience of the car is also, uh, you know, collides with the reliance on it. Um, uh, if you, I mean, Michael Sorkin, you know, his, his urban project about, how to make you know a sustainable city not a not a romantic uh new urbanist uh project you know it's a it's a bit like okay well that means taking a bit of la and taking a bit of jakarta and taking a bit of hong kong and right thinking about that because all cities have um uh well a lot of cities have you know elements that are incredibly um valuable, incredibly, um, connected to, um, well, let's say comfort or, or ease. I mean, cities are like instruments and you could want to want to use them, Hmm. you know, in a particular way. So you have to dissect everything about, you know, every particular city and in the, the, and in North America, obviously LA and, and New York are, are virtual polar opposites where they become the same again, I think is their world cities in terms of human capital and, you know, ideas in every field. I, I truly believe except for certain institutions like financial institutions and banking, i.e. wall street and so forth, that Los Angeles's, uh, density of, of, um, those institutions, whether it's in art or, or culture or education, you know, is equal, the format is completely different. I mean, the format of experience is completely uh, uh, different. The thing about Los Angeles that you have to agree to is, is I, you have to live more inside your head mm. than through your eyes. Uh, as New York presents itself to you, kind of lock, stock and barrel um, in a continuous presentation of itself, Los Angeles is all mystery all the time because most of it you don't know. Hmm. I'm, I'm sure I was on every street in Manhattan in my five years. <laughs> Whether I just went there or I had something to do, it was presented there yeah. all the way to the tip of the, you know, into the Bronx and so forth. But I can't say the same thing about Los Angeles, but that's okay. So the mystery is... Um, part of also the power that I would say you might not get living in another kind of city. So if you're sort of the person who likes a little dystopia, if you're the sort of person who 
has an active imagination and wants to, you know, sort of write film scripts in your head mm. as you're moving through the city, even though you're isolated in a car, that that activity, because all the sensorial stuff that's given to you in New York, you know, the, the script writes itself. Yeah. And I'm just saying that that's the way it is for me. And it's also not saying that that's um, at all, it's just simply different. I live there. I like Los Angeles because I call it the unsolved urban mystery. I like dealing with the question. I like dealing with not knowing. I like dealing with um, the the spectacle. Uh, I like dealing with the spontaneous. I like dealing with um, imagining futures. Mm. And um, that's a lot of the reason why I chose to live here because it felt free not in the hippie sense, but in the intellectual sense. Right, right. That's really interesting that you put it that way. And it makes total sense. Yeah. I have found that when I'm driving around in L.A., uh, that I, music is essential in order for me to, <laughs> to, to fabricate some kind of experience. And sometimes it's, it's you know, noir-themed or whatever right. it might be, whatever right. mood I'm in. But you are right, though. I'm creating, you know, uh, uh, making it up in my mind as yeah. I'm going. And music helps, obviously. Yeah. You were saying that you produce or make music or something in your garage? I spent time, um, yes, I have a studio that I built in my garage. One half of my garage is my wife, who's a massage therapist. Oh, nice. Um, and so she has her um, world full of crystals. And um, uh, I have a you know, world of uh, synthesizers and guitars and amplifiers. And um, so I can spend time uh, working with all of those things. I, I've been doing music. I'm an amateur, obviously, I'm not a professional, but I've been making music since I lived in New York. Really? Um, so the, what kind of music? Well, my really for the first I want to say 20 years, it was guitar based experimentalism that uh, I was into uh, in New York, which was really the the time when I was able to truly experience a, a kind of a radical approach, you know, to, to music. Um, so bands like Sonic Youth, for instance, um, who were my generation, I lived around the corner from CBGB's uh, in the East Village off the Bowery. So um i was just there like once a week um uh, listening to to bands and so i started by i i started playing acoustic guitar in undergrad and then like imagine myself being like just a regular guitar picker and then uh i discovered people like eno and more conceptual uh artists and musicians um and then moving to new york so i started buying guitars at pawn shops and uh amplifiers and stringing them differently and really mimicking a lot of what you know they were doing i would go to um jam sometimes with some friends um or rent studios in soho to be able to really play loud and so forth and I kept doing it and then just started working in more bedroom four track tape uh, work, but still no singing, uh, just experimental stuff, not really pop oriented, long form, lots of effects pedals, you know, running fuzz boxes through drum machines and then looping them backwards and, you know, just things like that. So um, that's the that's the ethic that I come from with the music. And now it's more actually disciplined. <laughs> uh, and I play modular synthesizers, uh, which is um, kind of a phenomenon, you know, from the 70s where you take <clears throat> modules and plug them together hmm. that, that create different, um, that affect the sound differently. And it's a whole subculture right now. There's about 15,000 people which is very, very small for anything around the world, you know, that post on YouTube and Instagram and uh, share. There's a um, thing called modular on the spot where people come and play 10 minute sets. They bring their machines off of um, in Atwater Village. Hmm. Um, and it ranges from minimalism to, you know, techno and all of that. I'm 
I don't do techno. I do I do more abstract things with it. And <clears throat> but you actually perform and are plugged in. I have I haven't performed yet. Um, I'm working up to. You're working. I'm working up to it. I since I have my office and teaching. Uh, I can't spend as much time because it's a very mysterious thing, you know these these machines. But I'll, I'm I'm getting to the point where I want to publicly perform uh, in the next couple of years. So um, we'll look forward to that. I'm looking, I'm looking forward to that as well, and it's a it's a great community. And in the meantime, I'm uh, working on lots of tracks, and I'll be putting up lots of new stuff on my SoundCloud. Um, you have a SoundCloud. Yeah, I've got one track up right now. Uh, I, but I have a SoundCloud. My uh, name is Inner Ideal. It's an Inter anagram of Neil Denari. Inner Inner Ideal. Inner Ideal. I, we're gonna definitely look that up. <laughs> that sounds cool. really cool. Yeah. And also the image of you in is the '80s when you're in in New York, right? Yeah. Yeah, East Village and Soho. That must have been pretty intense. It was. Uh, it was because New York hadn't been uh, Julianified. Right. It was At before all. it was before the subways were clean, before even yes. the, the whole I Heart New York campaign. Right? It was I, think, I Heart that New York of... was was around, but oh. um it was during Ed Koch's <clears throat> time as mayor. David Dinkins came in later and then and then Giuliani, but um it what was, was still like? <laughs> it was still pretty it was still pretty um like I lived on the edge of Alphabet City, not right in Alphabet. I knew people who lived in Alphabet City, and it was super, super dangerous. You could get, you could get fucked up, right? Uh, very easily. Um, bizarrely, you know, uh, exciting at the same time. Um, Tompkins Square Park was mm -hmm. always uh, uh, out, there. but it wasn't always. Also, the danger too it was what was going on in music. Uh, the art scene, the kind of early Pomo art scene uh, was happening um, and galleries were springing up, you know, everywhere. Keith Haring, Basquiat, um, they were, you know, sort of street art, but <clears throat> experimental music. Uh, I saw new music from, you know, scuzzy punk rock, post-punk rock bands to more academic people. Um, I stepped over junkies in my... Um, once I stepped over a junkie who was out in my um, lobby, but generally there were needles in the lobby and, you know, pick, stepping over needles to get to my mail and things like that. And, um, you know, AIDS, AIDS had just really exploded and things mm -hmm. like so in terms of the body, in terms of, of um, uh you know your your sense of your body in an urban environment it was it, it could be seen as shaky but on the other hand it was also if you lived in the lower east side or if you lived in in the east village it's it's also not to over romanticize it but it was also just part of life and um you know what was what was going on i think it was um a great learning experience for me and uh, when I came to California, you know, I experienced in a way nothing of that. It, I experienced more of this kind of idea of paradise, mm. which which I was always interested in in um, in being a part of. But I should also say that my first five years or so here, I spent a lot of time going into the noir world of L.A. as much as I could to to keep my connection to uh that side of uh you know culture i don't i don't right. say that i've got uh you know weird weird interests so much as a certain type of set of subcultural interests and <clears throat> in art and music and so forth that i don't actually share with lots of people let's hmm. say especially in in my profession they're they're not um maybe in, in that same coming from that same pathway, uh, but that's fine. Um, Wait, do you mean like the music endeavors? Yeah, mostly the the, the music. Mostly. Uh, yeah, mostly <laughs> the music. And But I mean, some of the performances I saw in New York, you know, um, 
butthole surfers in 1984 with naked go-go dancers and other things going on on stage. I don't and, know what any of that means. And, and uh, uh, at Danceteria, places that, you know, if anybody of a certain age is listening to or, or even, you know, lower than that, that I probably would have to censor that, you know, I was just witness to. It wasn't like I was, you know, there were some depraved things going on, but it was, it was performance art. Right. And, and it was, it was an aesthetic project, you know, of a certain type of, of realm. And, and I was super interested in that. And that's why I was, I was in New York to discover those things. And I think they've, they've, um, given me a lot of perspective, you know, on my own work. I, I'm, you know, I'm a normal, I'm a normal person, but I, I do think, you know, with a certain amount of, of, um, freedom and, and anarchy, you know, in, 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 in certain aspects of the, of the work, uh, in certain aspects of my life, in certain as aspects of my lifestyle, even though I, I'm, I, I go to great lengths to look super normal. <laughs> do, you wish, do you wish you could be more of an anarchist? <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, yes and no. I mean, I, I don't, maybe a lot of people might've imagined, I never was going to quit architecture and, you know, do music because I'm not as good at music as I am architecture. I'm way, way better. Although I could have dedicated my life to it, but, you know, just let's say the, the, the intensity of it, the performance aspect of it and so forth, but that's not what I was meant to do or, mm. you know, set up to do. So I don't have any regrets on that, but that's why I spend the amount of time that I do spend on it, uh, in my own kind of controlled environment. Uh, it's, it's super important. It's a form of research. Like I don't, I don't watch film nearly as much as I used to. And I just, I'm focused completely on extrapolating and from music and, and making it and seeing how I can, um, say something, you mm -hmm. know, with it. So. It's as it's as serious a hobby as one could have, and still be true to their calling. Um, right. Let's say, in my case, as an architect and a right. professor. And I should say that this quarter, not in my research studio, but in my options studio, I'm doing a a studio about minimalist music. We're designing a pavilion on the campus of UCLA based on this idea of hypnotic, uh, repetitious mm -hmm. uh, music. And it's been a really fun experiment to work on it with the students. So now I'm bringing it into school to see if my obsession with these things can be teachable. Right, right. So, but when you're writing songs and exploring and playing, are you're not setting out to necessarily to to figure out how it relates to your architecture to architecture. It's it's more of a internal personal thing, and it ends up obviously relating to other work that you do. Is that? That's true. I mean, it's not a, I think the, the one thing that I do, I love repetition. I love repetition in architecture. I love repetition in music. That's the kind of music that I've, I've generally preferred and gravitated toward, um, rather than classical music with beginning middles and ends and crescendos and tension and so forth. I'm very much more in the kind of hypnotic, um, you could say minimalist world, but minimalist music has so much texture and complexity, even though it doesn't have the hierarchy. <clears throat> hmm. I believe that, that our architecture, there's generally a little bit more hierarchy, but we're doing, let's say housing projects and things where there's a, a lot of repetition and I want it to be rigorous and fit together and enjoy that. I enjoy grids. Um, but the music isn't like a one-to-one -one correlation. Yeah. Being like, if you look at that, then you'll know what that. Absolutely not. It's a yeah. parallel discourse. Right, right, and that's the danger I think of, of researching or setting or just playing and having fun with something else. Yeah. When you're an architect, is everyone tends to just make a direct re formal relationship, right. right? Kind of thing. Right. Um, have you heard of the the Fontainebleau School of Music and Architecture? No. It's um it's a study abroad program for. I think you have to be at least a fourth year an undergrad. Most of the students end up being grad students, though. Um, ha happens in Fontainebleau, Fontainebleau, Fontainebleau? in France, and in France, France. Yeah. 
and the chateau. I've been there. You have? Oh, you did. I've been to the Fountain Blow uh, chateau. I've gotten a whole tour through it, and I've stayed the weekend in a villa in Fountain Blow because I knew the son of a man who trained all the motorcycle police officers <laughs> in um, in France. And that academy was in Fountainebleau. Really? And he had a villa and I played on beautiful, I uh, played tennis on beautiful uh, clay courts and I ate the finest food. So yes, yeah. I know. <laughs> I had a weekend in Fountainebleau. It Sometimes was, I'm not sure how well known that the place is, but uh, the chateau well is well known. I think, I think, it, I think it is for architects. Yeah. So uh, it's a study abroad pro a study abroad program that takes place in the chateau. Um, wow. It's a four week thing. Um, I know because I went I went there during mm -hmm. when I was a fourth year, yeah, fourth year something like that. And it happens in the summer, um, so not during uh, normal academic uh, uh, you know weeks. Um, but I think historically it used to be architecture, the arts, and music. Now it's just architecture and music, and so mm -hmm. roughly half of the student body is architecture students the other half are musicians from you know juilliard and whatever other institutions like really high mm -hmm. caliber people mm -hmm. and um there they are separate schools and that you have your own classes with architecture professors and the musicians have music professors but you collaborate with musicians every now and then and mm -hmm. they it's evolved to now every week they do a project with the musicians in some way mm -hmm. and the culmination at least when i was there was in the last week you do you create like an architecture slash art installation that is, and you're working with musicians who perform as part of it. But anyway, it's 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 a really interesting and program, and it reminded me of this conversation. Mm, I'll have to look into it. <clears throat> it's it's really cool. They don't have, for whatever reason, they don't have a strong uh, West Coast uh, presence. Mm -hmm. uh, like when I went, I was the only kid from the West Coast. Um, there's always a few from like City College, New York, um, and everywhere else. But it's an international thing, and it's an in English, so you get students from all over the world. Is of. it still offered at at uh, San Luis? It no, no. It, I think it used to be that you got some kind of credit, even though it was during the summer. But that was that ended. I don't know over ten years ago. I think mm -hmm. so. When I went, it was just on my own. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure why the program doesn't have a, a more presence on mm. you know, in California, but. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting, interesting, interesting thing because they they limit not to go on about it, but they not they limit the <laughs> the use of computers. So it's it's that also brings into a different kind of dynamic mm -hmm. that might be changing. But it's mm -hmm. really fascinating kind mm -hmm. of, and it's short and, mm -hmm. and affordable. <laughs> you're not Marina. You're not from Fountain Blow, are you? Or I am not. What city are you from or town? I am from a small town called Sur la Melo. It's like an hour north of Paris. Um, uh huh. Small town, six thousand people. Or so. Uh huh. <laughs> Teeny tiny. <laughs> so then I was like, yeah, I'm not into this. Did I'm you to move did to you York. venture into Paris some when you grew up? Growing up, not as much, but I studied architecture in Paris. You did. So I which, I got which school? Uh, ESA. No, no. Um, Ecole Nationale d'Architecture de Paris Val de Seine. Uh huh. <laughs> it's, well, you it actually, it's a, it's actually a fairly big school because they used to be split on like I, I think six different sites all over mm. Paris, and at some point I think in two thousand something they decided to regroup all of the sites in one major school. Mm. Um, so it was yeah, it was pretty big. Um, I mean it was it was good. I'm I'm glad I went to Paris. Mm -hmm. I applied to ten schools of architecture all around France, and I was like, well, you know what. Maybe I should pick one that's in Paris. Never know if you want to live abroad and apply for jobs. They see Paris. Everyone knows where it is. But I was not excited to go live in Paris. Because I'm from the countryside and Paris, you know, it's kind of like maybe, I don't know, people who live around New York City, but not in New York City. And I'm not particularly, you know, appreciating New York or the people from New York. It's kind of the same. The Parisian population in Paris has some kind of image to the rest of France. And coming from the suburb and small town, I was like, ah, I'm not excited. So mm -hmm. I didn't really like Paris for the first I don't know, year or so. <laughs> Do you mean like it, it took, arrogant? It took us Is... time to, you know, get to know each other and appreciate each other. But yeah. I mean, the people have this reputation of being arrogant. Is that part of the... Oh, yeah. Pretentious, arrogant. Okay. They think they're the best ones. You know, it's like... 
<laughs> but it's but those are ideas that somehow you hear from, from the outside without really knowing where those ideas come from mm -hmm. and you grew up with that but when you actually live in paris it's the people are arrogant <laughs> i mean there is arrogant people but there is arrogant people everywhere uh, you know saying that it's like who parisians are i think is is wrong mm -hmm. and unless you've lived there and you can save say that's the case that uh, maybe i will respect you if you're from outside of paris and you're saying that uh, it's you know mm -hmm. interesting pretty sure you've been on record saying the opposite that you hated all the parisians because they were arrogant no there is a lot of <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny though like you, you would be in paris for a year before like warming up i really to, because... really wasn't happy but you know you kind of have to challenge yourself like same when i went to study in california I never traveled as far as going to California. I only traveled in France growing up and around France. So I was like, okay, you have exchange programs. Where is the, f you know, further away destination you have on your list? That's where I'm going to try and go. And, and I think you kind of have to, you know, kick yourself in the butt a little bit and do things that you not, you would not necessarily do to, to, to experience new things and challenge yourself. And that's what you did. And that's what I did. <laughs> and now I'm back in paradise. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, Paris is such a beautiful city. It's uh, the first time I was there. I, I was amazed at how just aesthetically aesthetically beautiful it is. But you when see, it's not gray out. You see, that's something I realized after living in New York City. Living in Paris, I never realized Paris was that beautiful, mm -hmm. you know. But when I moved to New York City mm -hmm. and then came back to visit Paris, yeah. I was like, oh, well, yeah, mm -hmm. this is actually pretty nice because mm -hmm. you actually have something else to compare it to, mm -hmm. you know. Did you ever live in Paris? I did. I went after um, I finished my master's uh, program at Harvard and I went to, uh, I was there for six months um, and I worked at a aerospace company at the time called Aerospatiale and uh, they're now part of the Air Airbus right. uh, family. And my father worked in, in that company in Texas where they had a subsidiary uh, uh, building helicopters. And so he uh, was able to um, have me go over there. I had a, I had a, I wasn't a legal, I was on a tourist visa. Uh, so I wasn't paid legally. I got paid under the table um not very much but and i lived in the cité universitaire oh yeah, yeah uh in the uh dutch pavilion yeah and um i commuted on the LOL mm -hmm. to la Courneuve, uh, la Courneuve in yeah. the in near saint denis yeah five oh, days yeah. a week so i you know i worked and i made this commute and um i had my you know i, I learned enough french to to uh, make my way pretty quickly, um, just in terms of conversational and some technical language. They'd help me out with English, um, and I worked in a department doing mostly graphics. I did like elevations of the helicopters and inked and uh, for brochures and things like that because uh, I didn't have the technical skills right. that they needed. So I was really in the art department. Um, and on the weekends, then I would go see Le Corbusier projects or go visit museums. And so in, in essence, I was a tourist uh, who had a job, mm -hmm. uh, illegal job. Um, and I learned so much and it really is still a, a benchmark experience for me. And, and it's still one of my favorite cities um, in the world. And it was it was before I moved to New York, and so it was really the first serious kind of urban, uh, uh, you know, old old city that mm -hmm. I'd been to, and I got to stay there and really feel it and um, understand the history. Of course, I went to the cinema as much as I could, and um, it was just a sublime. You know, time. It was the beginning of Mitterrand, and it was the beginning of of all the grand projets. Um, <laughs> they hadn't been built; they were they were starting. You know, that led up to Arab Institute, and you know those kinds of things. Um, and I also think the thing about Paris that that I loved was while there could be conversations about the urban identity and and 
a sense of ownership and possible provinciality mm. of which I think we all um, experience, especially as an American who who speaks French with a terrible accent and <laughs> some people putting their hands over their ears going, stop. <laughs> well, at least you speak French. Stop. Well, yeah, but it hurt their ears because the... I'm accent, trying over here. <laughs> accent was, was pretty bad. But on the other hand, I think Paris, as opposed to Rome or some other cities, didn't take itself so seriously that you couldn't uh, let history, you know, have some changes. And I think the mm. socialist uh, enterprise of how you built social housing or why don't we go ahead and let a bridge go over a street uh, or a building cantilever into the Seine or we'll put a pyramid over here. Um, we won't have to make it out of um, stone, um, et cetera, et cetera. I always felt it was a liberal city compared to other cities like Berlin had to ask all these questions, you know, after the war, what are we going to be or Munich? How are we going to, you know, pursue rebuilding? Munich said, let's just make it like it always was. And Munich, uh, uh, Berlin kind of struggled. And because Paris was not, you know, destroyed, it's almost like they could have said, let's just keep it like a fossil and not do anything. Yeah. But it too grew, you know, population wise. And, um, that was what was surprising to me. I mean, to see Saint Pompidou uh, and knowing how many people hated it yeah. at the time, how many people just despised it and couldn't understand it. And of course, now it's a beloved thing, and and especially for young people. Uh, and it was it was a, a project that got built while I was in my undergraduate days. And I think I also, besides to see all the Corbusier stuff. Um, that building was, well, that's the new world mm -hmm. Yeah, sitting there in the old world. And I really wanted to go experience that. And, um, it had a big effect. Yeah. That's a pretty me. remarkable thing actually for a city like Paris that is, um, quite old and beautiful as it is to, for them to insert these really radical projects at that scale, especially the scale of the Pompidou yeah. Center, which is this giant well, brick of a building. It is pretty amazing. Nobody, nobody also wanted the Eiffel Tower. Yeah. I don't want that. I mean, I, <laughs> I remember one of the architects who worked with Foster uh, and Piano on um, Pompidou. I met him, um, and he told me that they got um, copies of letters written against the Eiffel Tower to to use uh you know when they're proposing oh. their project going you don't want it now right but give it some time mm -hmm. letter after letter after letter we don't want this ugly tower marking our city and um nobody knows about its iconicity and that's the thing is you know iconicity accrues over time and i hate the idea that that clients or cities go, you're going to build an icon or let's make a new icon. It's too artificial. Mm -hmm. So it, it, Pompidou is an icon, but it was also thought to be an eyesore, you know, to start. I suppose eyesores can be icons, but... Uh, I mean, it's a pretty aggressive building. <laughs> well, the, the it's unapologetic. Yeah. The juxtaposition with the existing urban fabric and that building yeah. is pretty contrasty right it's really really provoking but even they have some more recent projects like right by the pompidou is the it's a the, terminal no what is it uh yeah, uh, yeah subway maybe. station a big curved the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The yellow gold. green um it used to be a terrible terrible <coughs> subway station it's like like if you had Times square station what that's kind of what leal was and it was extremely dangerous actually like you would like, you know, and if you had to meet anyone in near that area, you would try not to go there because it was really unsafe. And there was some kind of park that was linked to it, but in a not safe design way. And it was a big deal when they ripped everything off and they rebuilt, you know, the entrance to that subway station and they had a whole bunch of stores, how to make that alive again, because no one really wanted to go there before. Um, and now it's this big gold glass dome that's a block away from yeah. Bubu. Um, yeah, that's interesting because after Babur, uh, the Leal was master planned, you know, they tore down a bunch of stuff and in the eighties kind of Pomo time. Yeah. 
and some stuff got built and it it always felt like it was very provisional and very messy yeah. and people mm-hmm, couldn't yeah. figure out what to do and still today yeah. you know it's almost like this um experimental site that can't figure itself out yeah. it's interesting they i'm not a huge fan of what they have currently i think the the if you've seen it and i don't know but the the color of the the canopy i haven't is, seen it actually it's kind of like a sickly yellow green color huh. maybe it was just the sunlight on that day but it's not as it's not gold you know, imagine gold uh-huh. be warm and it's, uh-huh. it looks kind of like a Putrid yellow. Oh, I see. <laughs> Maybe my glasses were okay. Up that day. Um, so Paris sounds like a pretty amazing experience. Why didn't you try and stay there longer or practice there? Aside from, I guess, the visa. Yeah, visas, which I, would be no. It, it, I had my eye on going to New York, and so this was it was definitely an interlude, and but a very serious one. In a way, it was my dad's sort of gift to me for, you know, graduating um, to be able to get me into this, you know, sort of situation because otherwise I wouldn't be able to go there except, you know, live in a hotel and look around yeah. for a month and then yeah. leave. Um, and that that they were willing, you know, this legitimate company was willing to take me on as a intern that they were going to pay under the table. They came and gave me cash every month. You know, this is wrong, but okay. <laughs> uh, that he he worked that out with him. I mean, that's a. I my father's passed away, so he won't be mad that I told anybody <laughs> public about about this. Uh, so. So how did you decide then to go to New York? Um, as opposed to going straight to California. Or. Yeah, or anywhere. Well, else. I, my plan always was to come to Los Angeles. Um, okay. Always. Um, Wait, are you from Los Angeles? No, I'm no. from Texas. But Los Angeles was just in the just pure knew. mythology, you know. From interesting. From here's where all the new ideas are. Here's where <clears> the new <throat> architecture is. Here's where the here's where um, rock and roll in you know America. I'm talking about like the '60s in, in a way. You know, when I was a really young kid and. Um, media, et cetera, um, it really did, you know, it was essentially like a understanding Disneyland coming to life as a, you know, as a real city huh. where by the time I went to, you know, GSD and so forth after that, it was like, I've, no, I've got to go to New York. I want to go to New York. It's a question of how long I'm going to be there before I leave because I was super interested in uh, living and working there. And as a, it was five years and it, along with Paris, you know, and obviously LA and Tokyo later on, those are the four benchmark experiences. Cause I lived in Tokyo in early nineties for eight months. Um, Do you speak Japanese? Um, I, I <laughs> spoke could? it well enough yeah. to, to get by wow. on, on a, you know, on a conversational level, I couldn't have any deep conversations. <laughs> um, those are the benchmarks, you know, of my uh, urban uh, experiences, and they're great to 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 think about in terms of all these questions we have about yeah. um, urban identity, uh, local culture, what is what what is um, uh, convenience and comfort about relative to a city? How is it as a user versus um, a, a person who? you know, can, can stake out an identity that's much greater than just simply, you know, using, uh, a city in a way in terms of its convenience. Um, a lot of people also graduating from GSD went to work in New York and you kind of picked an office, whether it was Meyer or pay or, and, uh, in my case, I went, uh, to work for an architect named James Stewart Polshak, who's, yep. um, just won the AIA gold medal. Um, yeah, and now. he was the <clears throat> dean at Columbia, and um, um, just an incredible person, an incredible liberal-minded um, working-class man from Ohio who who um, did great work and uh, ran a great office. He was he was very humane. It's also what gave me a good idea about what did it mean to have a an office where people wanted to work there as opposed to <laughs> it being a, um, a project about hyper intensity and 
you know, a false sense of, of uh, commitment. You can have a real mm. sense of, com anyway, I learned all these things there and it turned out uh, fantastic. And then I started teaching at Columbia. So I don't think I'd be the same person or architect if I hadn't done that time frame. And then the whole music thing yeah was just insane <laughs> <laughs> that 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 cast a lot of uh intensity into my thinking and my spirit it's got to right i yeah. mean it's it, it's it, you step outside and you're conf you step outside your door inside the apartment building and you're confronted with it yeah also uh i mean more or less by the time i got there which was late 82 um hip hop was hip hop was starting to show up you know in the street um as opposed to just in the Bronx, uh, where where it started in the you know in the in the mid and late seventies. <clears throat> so, as a music form and, and and as an art form and and as aesthetic, that was also going on. I mean, I I loved all that. I was still probably connected to more like white experimental music, <laughs> but um, it was a it was like a Spike Lee world all mm. the way through that time. You know, in the eighties. So I was also lucky that some of these cultural phenomena, I mean, rap and hip hop is the last new form of, of, of music. Mm -hmm. I mean, even electronic music today is really based on a lot of what went on in the seventies, mm. um, or the merger between the DJ and, and, you know, the experimental electronic project is a, is a morphing of those, you know, trajectories. So I felt very, uh, lucky to be around, uh, you know, the city at that time, especially at the kind of sonic level and um, uh, very indelible experience on me. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, obviously, New York has changed a, a lot yeah. since that time. Um, but specifically, the kind of the scene and the world that was created in East Village and Soho in the time that you were there, you know, it's it's it was an incubator for it is an incubator, yeah. really. Yeah. Um, and it's so tough now because Manhattan, as well as many other cities across the world, that's all gone away because prices go up, people mm -hmm. get pushed out, mm -hmm. and you're kind of left wondering the where where is the the current neighborhood or the next neighborhood that's going to act as an incubator for these next things. Mm -hmm. And it, it was when we were in in New York, there was definitely a sense amongst the the younger gener our generation that. Uh, Maybe it's in Bushwick, like way out in Bushwick, mm -hmm. but it's very peripheral um, because it's out there. Mm -hmm. So you kind of left desiring something and wanting to live in the in the New York City that you've heard about, like you're telling, mm -hmm. but you can't because it's not there anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's I don't have an answer to the question, but it's just an observation of I, I don't know where this next neighborhood is going to be, um, mm -hmm. and because we figure it out, then. So that'd be interesting to it's be there. It's interesting that you use the word incubator because it's so popular now with, you know, spaces like WeWork that try to kind of recreate mm -hmm. those hybrid creative population within um, interior space. Right. Which makes me think that it's not a new concept that they invented. I mean, the incubator was on a much urban scale before it was already existing. Right, they just monetized it and the, made it, it into just kind of disappeared with the gentrification and the cleaning up of mm. the city and then you know oh let's create incubator spaces and charge you money for it <laughs> but it's not but it's not a new thing well i mean that's if you think about incubation in the, the really broadest sense no but but yeah i don't know we need to talk to someone from we work for I, there was an article recently that was talking about how the company is evil despite its uh Right. the way it's old anyway um but so when you go back to new york city now obviously it is different is it like a shock to you do you feel you know disappointed in what it's become or you know is it is what it is um i think it would be too judgmental to say that I'd be disappointed, especially going sure. back to the issue of how do you build a city and what does it get transformed into? And if anybody were to take a crystal ball and say, well, probably Manhattan is going to be a place in which, you know, power and money are going to continue to flow into it, um, uh, even though it, it, it didn't begin as the 
you know, it began as one of the boroughs. And yes, there's there's a certain weight to it, mm -hmm. especially post-war uh, with, you know, the financial district and so forth. But middle class people lived in Manhattan, you know, up until uh, up until 2001. And even after 2001, in which I built a project there uh, in the uh, you know, in, in in an economy that surged back up after after uh, 9-11, uh, where, you know, prices went up quite a bit. It gave sponsorship to, quote unquote, interesting architecture. It was for the market. Um, what What's come out of that, of course, are is a certain level of architectural experimentation that obviously wasn't necessarily played out for the middle class. You know, there yeah. weren't. They weren't new, um, radical middle class housing. Probably, you know, the land was too expensive. They'd already been built, Stuyvesant Town, Peter Cooper Village, et cetera. They are all still there. You know, as as uh, Robert Moses uh, era. You know, kinds of projects, whether they work, don't work, or whatever. That kind of mixing of of um, ideas about city planning and and um, um, how to deal with you know, urban growth is still interesting, but of course it became a kind of diaspora for the middle class, you mm -hmm. know, having to, to leave Manhattan. Um, I, I'm would say that's a challenge for all cities, uh, uh, even Los Angeles, where we see the wave of wealth and tracking where the $1 million house is. Now you'd be shocked where the $1 million you know, houses is probably not far from my office in the West Adams district. Um, and when I go to New York, I, I go not to, you know, retrace any footsteps. I probably go as, um, as somebody who's just in, in engaging and inhabiting with it on its terms, which is, it's a, it's a kind of first world machine and I, and I go and I do whatever I do and I go around and I look at new architecture, um, meet friends, but sure on a day to day level, it's, it's, um, and even visually it's, you know, morphed quite a bit, but I don't, I don't think about it so wistfully Yeah, sure. necessarily. <clears throat> um, I think that's probably not the sort of person, you know, I am, I don't want to get into it at that particular level. Uh, I mean, the neighborhood that I lived in um, is now cool, and there's lots of nice coffee shops and yeah, so forth. Yeah, safe and, coffee shops. And when I grew up, there was, uh, when I was there, it was not, you know, that. It was scuzzy and gritty and, yeah. you know, and but that was fine. That was then. So your project... Yeah. You're going to say something? No, go for no? it. No? Okay. I know what you're going to say. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, your project on the High Line, right? Yes. Uh, HL twenty three. Yes. Is the number? Mm -hmm. um, that was that, that must. For, wait, is uh, it for High Line? High Line twenty three. Yeah. 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 That's, mm -hmm. that's a just, fair just guess. Checking. <laughs> mm -hmm. checking. That yeah. must have been one of the first uh, new uh, and contemporary pieces of architecture to go up adjacent to the High Line, if not the first. I'm trying to think back. Wasn't the first one. Um, I mean, you could say of the ones right next to the High Line, right on it. On it, yeah, right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, Frank Gehry's uh, IAC building, the white sail, yeah. <clears throat> was finished before. Mm -hmm. Jean Nouvel's project was finished right before, also for the same client as me. But they weren't right on the High Line. Mm -hmm. But they were part of the West Chelsea district. That one was done before yours? Just before. Oh, wow. It was, they were... In construction at the same time, right. uh, ours just took so long that it was a seven-year project start to finish. Wow. Really? Yeah. Why? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, we'd need another couple of hours <laughs> okay. to, to talk about why all the... Well, how long had the High Line itself, the, the, you know, the first chunk of it, been completed before you, you, your projects, you know, started construction or, or, you know, happened? Maybe uh, a year. Wow. Okay. Oh, so wow. did, did you, your office or you or, you know, the kind of colleagues have any idea that it would have the effect that it ended up having and that it would end up being this 
um, you could say like almost architectural collection of, of things, of different kind of chess pieces? Or... Well, I, I think that the developers uh, figured it out before mm -hmm. the architects did because they were the ones to call the architects and mm -hmm. they saw something um, that was became more and more obviously latent. I mean, when the Friends of the Highland, when, when uh, uh, it was thought that this thing could be preserved, you know, that was a lark. And mm -hmm. then, you know, they get funding started, all private money. And West Chelsea was just sitting there lying dormant. Um, the, the galleries had started moving in. Uh, Larry Gagosian had already been there mm -hmm. for a few years. So in a way, the art district moving from Soho, that was along with, oh, we should save this, you know, this piece of urban infrastructure. That was the romantic idea of, you know, protecting the sedimentations of history. Right. Meanwhile, the art world had moved into cheaper, bigger spaces, and those things just came together super quick. And uh, said, look, it's the next Soho, except we've got a lot more footprint to build new stuff or tear down, in our case, a one-story brick building that was uh, used for, I think, beer distribution or something like that. <laughs> um, so there was fallow ground in a way. Um, but Barry Diller, and who built IAC with Gary and... <laughs> the Jean Nouvel project, which was also co-developed by my client and another one. And then he eventually built another one with uh, Foster. And hmm. the idea of hiring name brand architects was another, let's say, current in the ocean that was all as opposed to just saying, well, we'll get a local architect to just crank out some stuff. Right. I think it was the art world the rise of global money and the migration of that and then the high line as a kind of this instantly cherished thing it just came together you yeah. know like like catalyst coming together and uh so it was enough of a sniff in the air that it was pretty it, it became very concrete for uh speculators who could go in and put in money and i think now it's up to I mean, with Hudson Yards, uh, <laughs> I think insane. it's it's past five billion in yeah. construction. It's the I think it's the largest privately funded uh, real estate project in the history of the United States. <clears throat> yeah, Hudson Yards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. it's crazy, insane. And and the the buildings that are going up there, some of the towers, they're not, you know, mid mid rise towers. They're giant high rises, and they're fat. Mm -hmm. You know, they're giant giant. They're big stories towers. And, yeah, and it's. Uh, yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty wild. Mm -hmm. I remember the first time we went on the High Line was two thousand nine. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then so we was, went. The it, so it was pretty, southern section had yeah, been completed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was you know you could still look around and see the city, right? Yeah. And the past before the past few months before we moved back here, we went back there, and you're, it's like being in a museum. You're behind people, and your view is. Obstruct, obst obstructed. obstructed by a whole bunch of buildings, which it's buildings a completely and different experience. Buildings and people. Buildings <laughs> and people, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, you know, talking about the evolution of an area or a neighborhood, I mean, things become popular, more people come, that's what happens. But it was really nice, I remember, when we had first moved to New York, to be able to walk on the Highland in a leisurely sense. Like, it was, there's space, there's kind of, mm -hmm. you could contemplate have a new perspective of the city, see some really nice architecture, and just kind of mm -hmm. walk and think. Um, but now, especially if it's on the summer day, there's no walking and thinking. It's more like just not stepping on the person in front mm -hmm. of you kind of deal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes, it's it's. I think it's the second uh, most visited tourist site, or now it's called a tourist site. Yeah, right. yeah. And um, it it's a whether it's a victim of its own success or mm. whether it was meant to be a local um, catalyst, it's not. It's obviously a, a des destination, destination device. And right. so it probably wasn't thought about for that kind of capacity. <clears throat> um, and um, 
so it's interesting that that becomes a one it, it's a it's a bad metaphor but it's a bit like an attraction in a in a in a in a theme park um but again i don't want to characterize everything in the wrong way it's just an analogy to talk yeah. about we need to go see that yeah um to say that we've been in the city what i think is great about it though i mean i've been on it when it's been pretty packed i haven't been in you know in a few years now but um the i think is i think the the buildings I, all i know is i can say the same thing about my building is that that um people could look at the building and see it as a also an a, a, an amenity to the attraction here's a weird piece of architecture or you can just keep moving past and look at people and i think in that sense it's it's um it can be experienced or the space or the activity can be thought through the art projects or another, you know, sort of element, um, people watching, et cetera. So if there's an upside to all this kind of, uh, attraction to it, then it's maybe different ways in which you would be forced to experience it or yeah. could experience it. Yeah, that makes sense because when you're at ground level in Manhattan, um, obviously it's a very dense urban environment. So all the buildings are lined up right against each other. So mm -hmm. it's this wall effect. Mm -hmm. And the streets of Manhattan are crazy enough to where you're not really paying it. You're not looking up all the time at buildings unless you're an architect. You're kind of just trying to navigate around people and, mm -hmm. and whatever. And the Highline provides it. It's interesting because it's it's elevated, first of all. It's also s separate from the buildings a little bit. And then yours and most of the ones adjacent to it, right up against it, You know, there's there's multiple sides to it. And people are getting to kind of visually consume the building in a much more um assuming they don't just walk by it but they mm -hmm. get to consume it in a much more hmm, from like different perspectives more mm -hmm. profound it's kind of too mm -hmm. heavy for word but mm -hmm. a different way than just like a facade that you're just walking by that's a storefront that you're you know cruising mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. it is interesting well i i think if you said that I mean, take my project or Zaha's project, you know, it's super exotic and you're going, I've never seen anything like that. What is it? You know, it's a true spectacle. Um, I, I would agree that, um, that there's a, I want to say there's an entertainment uh, factor to that, which is also still based on what architecture does in a city. If you go to Paris, Pompidou is an icon. It, it, it's an attraction. Um, and in the case of the High Line, because you're moving along, along it, then these buildings become kind of like dioramas mm -hmm. in a natural history museum. Right. You're just to, missing the conveyor belt. <laughs> yeah. You, to, to study what's going on. And, you know, over time, depending on how the mythology works, it's a bit like, okay, these buildings were built in you know, 2010 to 15 and that economy was happening during that time. Mm -hmm. Just like when we look at sixth Avenue and we understand not only stylistically, you know, gray flannel suit modernism from sixties, you know, straight clean, uh, and that world. And then the post 2001 world was, well, it's real estate, but the real estate has to come in certain kinds of packages. Yeah. for it to, you know, maximize itself. So that was the interesting thing. Developer sees added value in design. Architect gets to design. It's, it's, it's you know, the highest uh, alliance between, you know, two speculative agendas. Right. And if you're going to do something, then do it that way and make it, you know, really great. As I've written in in a couple of articles even the best architects weren't given interesting commissions in new york between say 1970 and 19 and 2000 when richard meyer built his first tower he had never done a building in new york except for west beth which was a renovated building in the west village uh hmm. the architect i work for uh Jim Polshak was doing housing, but it was exposed slab, brick, punched windows, super expedient, do the best you can. Nobody was right. throwing money at it. 
And that's what the market was demanding, even though it was in Manhattan and there were good rentals and you could get a good price for it. But there wasn't any ability to you know, do anything. Stephen Hall still hasn't built like a housing project, for instance, yeah. in New York. Um, Todd and Billy, maybe that's not their thing. They built some you know, public buildings. But um, in a way, New York didn't, didn't want anything great for a while yeah and it kind of took this unmitigated uh, uh, uh challenge to their their the the city's identity losing the twin towers and then the defiance came which is great and i was happy to be involved in that and as i've also said new york kind of opened its doors up to you know west coast architects because <clears throat> right Frank, Gary, Tom, Maine, and me are the f first three architects from Los Angeles to do freestanding buildings in New York. And in fact, Frank's was the first one. And no LA architect had ever built a freestanding building really? in wow. New York. That's kind of surprising. Uh, New Yorkers. Or not. No, what? We're not. Well, we're not. We're not. I feel like New Yorkers sometimes look down on Californians and people from the West Coast. Well, yeah. They function within their own world you know? <laughs> well if you if you think about it um obviously new york architects had built things out here um i don't have the list but you know uh, pay Cobb and free <clears throat> doing the yeah. tower um hardy holzman pfeiffer doing uh lacma but neutra never did a building just thinking mm -hmm. of the the architects Neutra never did a building there. Just um, uh, she, Eames, Schindler, you know, the, yeah. the people who did houses weren't morphing into uh, corporate architects. Mm -hmm. um, Pereira, um, 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 who else? I wonder if it had to do with a, if, if there's the perception that maybe these folks didn't have the expertise to do a larger scale project probably you know? and there are plenty of architects in new york to do the work yeah, yeah. um yeah. from all you know from from the entire history of the city there are always new york's uh, architects who were great you know could do the do the work and um uh california may not have always been able you know to say that to to you know to that extent <clears throat> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so it wasn't though until Frank, who, you know, had eclipsed everyone and become and still is the most famous architect in the world and has a long association with Barry Diller and that, okay, that makes sense. You're, you're not going to just say I'm in New York now and I'm going to hire, um, Meyer to do it. Yeah. And then, you know, Cooper puts out, Cooper's a different project and he won that over Zaha and other people. And in my case, it was a bit more kind of curiosity and happenstance uh, it's a, another longer story um but let's say the fact that somebody who was wanting to build an interesting building was willing to hire somebody outside new york was based on i understand you have a reputation and it's pretty interesting and you should be given a chance you know to do this and that will maybe sell pretty well um that also was a very you kind of unique time because I believe now people are tending to, I'm doing most of my work in LA now, which is fantastic. And only the upper, upper strata of architects, the Pritzker prize level are still operating to me at the level of the global, or you can put in Bjarki or somebody like that. But I think architects who might've thought, including me, that you'd just be building around the world um, isn't, you know, the, isn't the case anymore. And mm. I think building in your own city is, is a fantastic thing, even though I don't still say I'm strictly a local architect, but, um, we have, we will have this year by the end of the year, like five or six freestanding buildings in construction, wow. uh, which is, a you know, way more than we've ever had, uh, 
So I'm quite happy about that. Um, and I think relative to the conversations about where one comes from and the cities that one engages in, the benchmarks that you have, you know, for me, Los Angeles is, 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 I remain here because of these possibilities and this mystery and, right. um, the, the challenges, the hardships, the, the, um, things that do make it, you know, interesting are the things that also make it problematic. Um, but, um, if you, if you stay in the field long enough, right, you see a lot of things <laughs> for sure. And I always feel like I'm just getting started. Yeah. Oh, God. Oh, no. <laughs> I think that's a good thing, baby. Yeah. Um, well, we are smack out of time. Uh, this was really great though. This was really interesting. Um, and the door is always open and hopefully again, we'll get you, have you on and talk about more stuff and hear the story behind why it took seven years to build it. Yeah. <laughs> <HL 23. laughs> Absolutely. Marina and David, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure to um, come out to Woodbury and, and chat with you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. thank you everyone for listening to this week's episode of the Midnight Charette. And thanks again to our guest, Neil Denari. We are on Spotify, iTunes, and YouTube. Please leave us a review in the uh, podcast app that is the Apple iTunes podcast app if possible um, because those reviews actually matter and apparently we can't get reviewed or rated on Spotify or Google Play because those platforms don't allow it so find yourself at the podcast find yourself find the podcast app leave a review if you can we have a website it is midnightcharette.com on there we have all of our previous episodes where we interviewed a number of architects and other creative professionals and we'll continue to do so uh, reach out to us on any of the social media platforms for any questions or yeah. and we are on youtube and we're on youtube so subscribe to our channel on youtube if you want to see what neil denari looks like he's <laughs> on youtube um and uh reach out to us if you have any suggestions for things that we should talk about or people that you we should interview uh uh, we don't do remote interviews currently so any anyone in the southern california or northern california region let us know and we'll, we'll figure it out if we approve <laughs> Um, what else is there? I think that's it. Thank you, of course, for listening. It means a lot. And we hope to, to, uh, hope you continue listening and we'll speak to you again next week or sooner. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.